At last, the traveller in the paths of time arrives on the frontiers of eternity. So here he's describing the, it is the culmination of the long journey from life to life, from scale to scale. This is the whole purpose of our manifestation, our existence. The person that is slowly growing, slowly emerging as a passenger, this is himself, this is the Divine. The Divine remains screened, invisible. Gradually he changes him, his image self from form to form. That is, every form becomes a little more a manifestation of his consciousness. That is evolution. All the possibilities of perfection are latent, but this expression, this manifestation takes place gradually. It doesn't come out in one outburst. So, we have to make a long journey through time, through experience, and move from the small, limited existence not just the worm, but we have the mentality also of a worm in a human body. We can be very small, very limited, gr slowly grow out of that and become an expression of the Divine that is within us. So the outer expression becomes nothing but an image of the inner reality. That is what the purpose of existence is all about to be on the outside what is hidden within us. Otherwise, we always remain divided, that within us there is a Divine Presence. Why is it not evident on the outside? We have so many flaws, so many deficiencies, so many defects, and we say, well, that is what a human being is. But gradually, through time, through experience, the human being is given the opportunity to break out of those limits, slowly, like a sculptor, and he gives the image of the sculptor, who chisels, who shapes, who perfects his vision of the deity that he wants to express. But this inner sculptor, he shapes. But in the shaping, he has to hammer, he has to chisel, he has to break down resistance of the stone. In the same way, he has to often hammer us, shape us through all kinds of blows, difficulties, so that that inner perfection comes out into the open. And at last, after the long journey, he, travel, he arrives at the frontiers of eternity, from time into the eternal, slowly, because the eternal is there within us, but we consider ourselves children of time, children of limitation. Slowly, this passenger begins to feel that he is an expression of the eternal. In the transient symbol of humanity draped, he feels his substance of undying self and loses his kinship to mortality. So the mortal slowly is replaced by the experience and the consciousness, the identification with the immortal. The two are not opposed to one another. It is as if our human stage, our human, or the stages, the changes that we have to come, go through from the lesser to the greater. And unfortunately, this change is not <coughs> always a movement that goes forward. We come, go forward, we go fall back. There are ships that drown. There are ships that break up to start our journey again. And so from life to life, it is not as though we are always progressing. 
we could, we should, but we don't. Because that also is part of the divine plan. We have to take up all the resistances of the lower nature as well. And they don't want to change. That is part of their makeup. So the unconscious, the subconscious, the hostility that is hidden deep within us, all these have to be shaken so that they begin to manifest what is hidden within them. But we are so accustomed to being imperfect, it's difficult. That's what the, we don't collaborate, we don't participate. Your mind or heart may say, I want to aspire, I do aspire, but your body or your lower nature does not. So it is a very slow, long change. But as he says, this too, he, the divine, makes use of. He pushes us down, sometimes to rock bottom, so that there is only one way, which is up. We have to climb out, climb up. So we all are symbols, the transient symbol of humanity. Our human, our human nature is a symbol. Is a symbol. Our transience is a symbol. Our transience is a symbol. Therefore, the human who considers himself a transient being, it's only a draping. You are not your clothes. You are not your coverings. The real you is within. So, in that case, the symbol becomes uh, uh, different from the real reality. No, there are different realities. So, there is the real reality, the real, the one. No, and this is not an unreal symbol. reality either. It's a temporary reality. Yeah. The so outer humanity form. humanity is a temporary It's a temporary expression. state, yes. But it is not unreal, nor is it illusory. And therefore we identify so well with it. It's very much there. Very clever. <laughs> it is... Within that is that which is the superhuman, so well hidden, so little known by us, that we don't really connect with it. So humanity is a symbol, transience is a symbol, everything is a symbol. Everything is a symbol. Because everything stands for something other than what it seems. Oh, right, right. That's, That's what a symbol is, isn't it? It stands for something other than what it appears. It's true, every symbol, everything is a symbol. Maybe that's what I try to express by saying that it's this, it, there's a distance from the real reality. The real reality is what it is and the symbol uh, stands for it. It stands for it. Just as an expression. But it is true, real as well. It's real as well, yes, I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> but otherwise we always connect with our mortality, with our imperfection, with our limitations. And we say, I'm human, I'm like this, I cannot be other than, than this. He is the eternal, He is the perfect, He is the absolute, I am not. But how do I move towards the absolute? It's the relative incomplete being slowly that grows into the fullness of His nature. Evolution is a movement that takes us to the completeness and the fullness of our possibilities. And that takes a while, anything in nature. It takes time, even for a tree to grow into its total fullness, takes its own time. From the seed to the tree, it has to pass through different stages. Man is just... It's not... Where does the tree come from? It is in the seed. Very well hidden, but very much there. In the same way, where is the Divine inside us? Very well hidden. But we accept our surface existence, which is very real for us today. That is what we are, we say. When he feels that undying Self, that undying Self is the Soul. But usually you say, in the transient symbol of humanity draped, he feels his substance 
of undying self. The soul is a substance, it's not something that is pure spirit, spirit in matter, substance is matter, not to just separate matter from spirit. In the self, in the body, in the form is the spirit. This is what is fundamental and special to Sri Aurobindo's vision. When our physical form, the cells, the body, the shape, matter, can express what is hidden inside it, then that would be the final stage of manifestation. Until then, there is a division between matter and spirit. The spirit is hidden in matter. Slowly it comes out here and there, now and then, in a moment of opening, in a moment of devotion, in a moment of connection with the truth. These are like signs that we can connect with something which is above us, beyond us, but how can you connect with something unless that something is not there already inside you? That part in you is what connects. If you don't have light inside you, how can I, you open to the light? There has to be that presence is already there. How can I feel joy, love, truth, light, all these things, the, the things I, I really yearn for, how can I feel them? Because I know they are there inside me, but I have them in a fleeting way, in an incomplete way, in momentary experiences. I want them in a most total and complete experience. This is the purpose of the journey. A beam of the Eternal smites his heart. His thought stretches into infinitude. All in him turns to spirit vastnesses. So, heart, mind, everything becomes a, an expression, turns to the spirit vastnesses, matter. So thought sometimes is very, very difficult to convince because thought is an instrument of, of light. But it likes to divide, it likes to analyze, it likes to, you know, explain, to be able to accept that there is no limit. The moment we divide, we make limits, we make categories, we make oppositions. So that broken, limited instrument of light slowly becomes an expression of endless light. Just as the heart, a beam of the eternal smites his heart, he gives a strong word. It's as if the heart, which is all closed up in its little world of individual life and love and joy, suddenly has to be it has to be broken out of that. It has to become one with the eternal and the infinite. The little ego, the little personal life, this has to be replaced by an experience of that which is the all. It comes as a blow, often a shock. Everything has to turn to spirit vastnesses. The small has to become the vast. His soul breaks out to join the Oversoul. The individual flame of the Divine Presence inside, which is pushed in the background behind so many layers of our psychological nature, this breaks out now, become part of the Universal Spirit that is there in all, that is everywhere, that is the Divine Consciousness, that is there in the cosmos. His life is oceaned by that super life, not these few, you might say, years of energy that is given to each of us, which you say, this is what I am allotted and whatever I have to do, I have to do it within this time 
with this energy that is mine. If I can draw endlessly from the universal source of Shakti, of consciousness, of force, of existence, which will lead to the supreme delight. He has drunk from the breasts of the mother of the worlds, the creative energy that is the mother of the worlds. She is the one who gives birth, who manifests all things at all times. From her, there is the endless source of power and consciousness. To be one with that, to draw from that, there is no sense then of exhaustion, of tiredness, of weakness, of frailty. All these things go away. Why can't we be like that? We have moments of connection perhaps with the Divine. But to be constantly drawing from that source of all creative power, it is the Supreme Shakti. This is what the sage is doing. This is the yoga of the soul's release. Release from its, all its different sheets, all its different, you might say, envelopes and drapings behind which the soul remains completely in the background. This is the yoga where the king breaks down each and every barrier so that he becomes one with the universal existence, the ex universal conscious force, so that he remains undisturbed by time, by change, by any form of weakness. A topless supernature fills his frame, now not only heart and mind, but body. Frame is the outer body, which here he says supernature. Nature is the form that is given to us. But this, even the world of form, of matter, is an expression of the supreme creative force. So, to be able to draw from this, so that there is no decay, there is no degradation in the body, there is no death anymore. This is the ultimate end. She adopts his spirit's everlasting ground. She is the mother of the worlds. She adopts his spirit's ground. It is manifesting in the body. The spirit that is manifested in a body. She is the one who takes over. We are usually the author of our own, you might say, action, or so we think, our own intelligence, our own decisions. If we allow this little one to be pushed away, and if we allow that force, that conscious force, to lead us forward, then it is everlasting. There is no limit. There is no end. There is no death. She adopts his spirit's everlasting ground as the security of her changing world and shapes the figure of her unborn mites. So shapes the figure of her unborn mites means manifesting the future. But first he has to become an expression. One man, one example has to be first there, manifesting the truth, as he says later, one man's perfection still can save the world. This is the security. It can be done. It has been done, even if it is one person. After that, all that has to come, all the possibilities of the future. It is not that once, as Mother Boza once asked, when the supramental manifestation takes place, 
when we all become supramentalized, when, when that will happen, we don't know, but anyway, when it happens, is it an end? Is it finished? He said, no. It's a continuous movement. It never stops. It doesn't move. Whereas in the lower hemisphere, in the lower planes, there is a change from imperfection to less imperfection towards perfection. In the higher hemisphere, where there is no ignorance, where there is no inconscience, there is a change from one mode of perfection to another mode of perfection. It's, that never stops. It's there at the end of the book also. Hmm? It is not that it is just something that is linear. It's something that is complex, diverse, various. But in that world of infinite variety, the play of the divine always continues. The consciousness is what remains. But the manifestation keeps on changing. So all these, immortally she conceives herself in him, in man, in the yogi, in the one who has made himself ready. She prepares the manifestation of new possibilities of endless perfection. It's an endless progression. It's not once and for all that you have become divine, you have changed, there is nothing more left for you to do. No. The eternal manifests himself eternally. There is no full stop, there is no end. In the creature, the unveiled creatrix works. The creature is man. The mother of the worlds, the Shakti is the creatrix. She's always at work. Nature is working. This Shakti is working through all existence, through all experience. But it seems veiled. Veiled by our resistance, our inertia, our disbelief. But all the same change does happen. When this disbelief, the inertia, resistance, hostility, these are consciously wiped off by the seeker. This is the yoga of knowledge. This is the jnana yogi, this is what he is doing. He can consciously wipe off all that comes in the way of the manifestation of truth. Then the human becomes an expression of the divine consciousness, unveiled. Her face is seen through his face, her eyes through his eyes. The Divine Mother manifests herself through her creation. At the, you might say, summit of the change of evolution is man. So it is in man that this conscious participation of becoming an expression of the Divine takes place. It is there, the participation unconsciously throughout all creation. Nothing can be without the working of this Shakti. In man also we are often completely unaware, unconscious. But the seeker of knowledge, the seeker of truth becomes a conscious participant. That is why now and then if you read Mother's Prayers, she says, will you collaborate? Will you help? How can you help her? Just by letting her work through us, without resistance, without questions, without doubt, not saying all this is not possible, it can't be done. If we just allow the work to be done, we become empty channels. The force can flow through us without hesitation. Her face is seen through his face, her eyes through his eyes. You see with her vision, you become an expression of her. To be able to do just that, to become an expression of the Divine. Nothing 
of the ego remains, no attachment to our little self remains, it's all gone. His being, her being is his through a vast identity. Man becomes one with the supreme force, the supreme conscious creative force, which is the mother. That is the mother power. When this happens, then is revealed in man the overt divine. The divine is there, covert in everything, hidden, well hidden. The divine will be manifested in an overt manner. That is the future of humanity. A static oneness and dynamic power descend in him. The static oneness is the consciousness, the dynamic power is the force. So there is the sense of identity, I am one with the Divine, I am conscious, and the Divine is working through me and I allow the Divine not, I don't interfere, I don't resist, the force flows through me, so that is the dynamic power. The he and the she, that is why this is the Ishwar and the Shakti, the consciousness and the force. Man can become an expression of this one in two. This is the, not really a duality, it is two aspects of the same. A static oneness and dynamic power descend in him, the integral Godhead seal. That is the stamp. Otherwise, usually there are those who call power, help, guidance, force with so much intensity that some, usually some power is received by them. But they don't have the consciousness. That is the nature of the titan. On the other hand, there are those who find that in the world of action and expression, we tend to lose connection with the Divine. We forget ourselves and we, get, we plunge into the play of forces. So the solution is usually you withdraw from all these things and remain constantly concentrated only on the consciousness. So this is what the sages often did. But to be able to remain in that state of oneness, connected, concentrated on the Divine, knowing that only He is, nothing but the Divine is, I am only He. And it is through me that He is working. My being is only an instrument. That is the culmination of this yoga. <clears throat> is that why he's using the word integral, like in integral, integral yoga? Yeah, right? it is the integral yoga. His soul and body. It's not that the soul alone comes out into the open and the body remains totally passive. The body becomes an expression of the soul. There is no opposition. His soul and body take that splendid stamp. So this is the fullness of the journey. And now there's a very beautiful sentence. That this is a long evolutionary journey. And so a long dim preparation is man's life. It's a long story. We are given this chance of a life in the body we are unaware of what is moving through us. We don't know where the energy comes from. We don't even ask. We take life almost naturally, automatically. Gradually, when that dimness, that ignorance, that sense of taking everything for granted, which is a terrible thing, when that seems to fade, there's a beginning of awareness, of gratefulness, that something is being done through me. Otherwise, I am a living being, the life force is moving through me, 
that is nothing special, it moves through everybody. This is the beginning of the journey, the sense of ignorance, of unconsciousness. There is a churning that has to start there. Slowly out of that we have to emerge. A long, dim preparation is man's life. A circle of toil and hope and war and peace. One line and he packs the entire existence of man in these four words. Everything, you have to struggle. Sometimes you have to fail. You have to suffer. And when we suffer, we realize perhaps why we are suffering. Something in us has not collaborated, is not sincere, has not aspired, and so we are at war with ourselves. We may say, I want, and something in us does not want. This is the truth for a very long time. There is the lower nature that just does not accept to change, does not believe that it can change. And so the war is there. Wars are not only outside us, wars are within us. To come out of that and find the sense of harmony and oneness and that alone gives peace. So it's a long circle. It's in a very slow circle, symbolizes often infinity, eternity. There is no beginning, there is no end in a circle. So, it's an endless story. It's not done in one life. It can be done in one life if one is truly keen and is capable of constant, sincere aspiration. But otherwise, nature works her way slowly through us. A circle of toil and hope and war and peace tracked out by life on matter's obscure ground. Matter is resistant, matter is inert. Life is an energy that cuts through the hard substance called matter. We have to go through these things and it is because this energy cuts through the resistance of body, of matter, that there is toil. It's not smooth, it's not journey. But a new manifestation cannot take place. You get the symbol of the peasant. He has to plough the ground, cut open the soil. Only then can there be a, a new rich harvest. He can't plant the seed unless the ground is ploughed. Similarly, we have to be ploughed. We have to be... Often these things have dig deep into us, open up all the hidden, dormant possibilities that are there, because everything is there, all possibilities are there, but they have to be brought out into the light. They stay hidden until the time is ripe, until we are ready, ripeness is all. So when we are ready, those possibilities come out. But the readiness is preceded by toil, struggle and then hope because hope is that which makes us beginning begin to yearn for something that is not yet done it's a truth it's a light it's a manifestation that is still distant but it is ahead of me someday that will happen i believe it will happen i can, i know it can happen it's not, I don't have it yet, but if I can really believe it can happen, because something in me is already connected with that truth. And so hope is that which leads us forward. But there is all the other elements that are, that don't accept, that don't want to change. This is what we are usually, our problems that we may have, and surely we do have faith in the Divine, in the Grace, 
And when difficulties and struggles come in our life, we ask for the grace to help us. And grace, in fact, does help us. And you say, yes, the divine grace is there, it is helping. But does it make us realize that the grace is there almost in spite of us? We have to collaborate. We don't, it's not, you know, it's rather, I don't know, I would use the youth ungrateful. He does everything for us and we do nothing in exchange. I used to work, hmm? to work silly. Yes. So <laughs> it's just silly. that, that the grace is always there. There is not a moment that you cannot breathe without the grace. But it's so easily there that we don't open to it consciously. Except when there is a, a difficulty, then you say, please help. And when nothing, no difficulties come, you forget about it. But why don't difficulties always come? Because it is there, the grace. That's the reason why we can pass through days and weeks and years of life which is without suffering. It's, suffering doesn't happen all the time. Because it happens now and then, we call it suffering. If suffering were constant, we wouldn't call it suffering. We would say this is normal. It's because it is not normal that you call it suffering. It happens now and then. It should happen all the time. That we should be, become aware. Therefore, we have to suffer. We have to be given blows. We have to be shaken awake from this dullness and inertia and selfishness, self-centeredness, as if the world is something that is given to me for my own satisfaction, for my own success. Who am I? I am nobody. I have been created by the Divine. And I have to be worthy of that opportunity. That is the whole point we have to make. So it is a slow, long preparation. A long, dim preparation is man's life. A circle of toil and hope and war and peace, tracked out by life, which is the opportunity for all experience. Life is the field of all experience, on matter's obscure ground. In his climb to a peak, no feet have ever trod. Ultimately, to manifest physically the Divine Consciousness. There have been be yogis who have reached the highest height of, you might say, realization. But he uses the word feet, as if an embodied material consciousness can become an expression of the Supreme. Again, this is the Supramental Yoga. He seeks through a penumbra shot with flame. Penumbra, this half light, half shadow, which is usually the state of our mind. We have a little light, a great deal of greyness, dullness, shadow. But now and then a flash can come, an intuition can come, a vision or an inspiration can come. They do come. But those are the signs that we can be open to a new light. Even if it's just once I have a flash of vision, it means I'm capable of it. Mostly I forget. Mostly I fall back into my ordinary state of half light, half grayness. But in spite of it, he seeks through a penumbra shot with flame. What does he seek? A veiled reality, half known, ever missed. Because the penumbra remains, the dullness remains, and therefore the truth is half known. 
we don't have the total identification with it. And until we know the all, we really don't know anything. Just to know a part or a, of anything means we don't know it. If I want to know something, I have to know it totally. And that can be done only if I become that. It is knowledge by identity. And this is ever missed for a very long time if we rely on our present instrument of knowledge, which is mind. Mind is not a complete instrument of knowledge. It is a partial instrument of knowledge. So he seeks a veiled reality, half known, ever missed, a search for something or someone never found. We want something perf perfect, wonderful, beautiful, eternal, immortal. These words are there in our vocabulary because they mean something for us. Perfection means something. Eternity and immortality, I really believe in them. But I never really experienced them. But then why do these words exist? Because something in me says it should be possible. Half known, ever missed. Because I don't understand that I have to become totally an embodiment of that perfection of that eternity, of that infinity, simply dreaming of it, wanting it, hoping for it, is not enough. I have to become an embodied being. Total transformation. Otherwise, it remains a cult, as he says in the word. Next line. A cult of an ideal, never made real here. An ideal is what you conceive in your idea. It's a perfection which exists in an abstract world of thought. But until we live that perfection, it is just an ideal. Ideals have to precede realizations. You have to live that ideal, you have to become that. But if you make it only a cult, and that is one of the problems of religion, often you have the notion that I do some puja and I worship and I chant some mantras and hymns, I have connected, perhaps I have, who knows, with some higher power, but how long does that last? Can I really remain in that state of utter identity with the force I have invoked? Or is it something that I may do, say for a while, I may go to the ashram and sit and meditate on the Divine Mother and Sri Aurobindo for a while. Can I really remain in that state of connection with the Divine all along, all the day and even at night? I accept the fact that I can't, I am not like that, but 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes, half an hour, it's, it's fine. It's better than nothing. Well, yes, maybe it's better than nothing. But well, I'm not sure if it's better than nothing. There is a certain honesty when you say, I, I, I can't, it's over. But there is a certain self-satisfaction that comes, that I have gone and I have done my pranam at the samadhi and so I have got an inner connection, even if it's for 10, min 10 seconds or 10 minutes, why can't I hold on to that? It doesn't become real until it becomes realized, embodied. Otherwise, it's a cult. Cult of an ideal never made real here. But this is the long preparation. This is a stage, hopefully, we have to grow out of. We have to pass through the stage and then grow out of that stage. An endless spiral of ascent and fall. Because when there is aspiration, hope and aspiration and vision, intuition, there is an ascent, no doubt. And then there is a forgetting, there is a downward pull, 
that is coming down into the ordinary consciousness. And so, as Sri Aurobindo says, this is a vertical spiral. We go up and come down. We go up again to come down again. And what goes up very high comes down very low. What goes up very low finds the energy to go up higher than before. It keeps on going up and down, but the spirals keep become bigger and bigger. Bigger and bigger. Because the lower we fall, we draw the energy from below to rise higher than above, than before. It's vertical, it's not this, it's not horizontal. It has to be like this. Like the sling, yes. David sling. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So it's an endless spiral for a very long time of ascent and fall. So we mustn't complain that why are we going through these difficulties. Instead of complaining, we have to find out why, what is missing, what is lacking, and Work on ourselves, that's all. But time is that field of change, and we are given that field takes time, it takes lives, until at last we reach the giant point through which His glory shines for, for whom we were made. We break out of this constant rising and falling, and we reach the top the peak. And if you reach the peak, it is just a point to which we become that, we become expressions of that light. We were made to be that. The whole manifestation is an expression of the Divine. This world, this creation is His and is an expression of the Divine. At present it is not yet, because the creation itself has forgotten. It has forgotten that it is Divine. We have forgotten that we are Divine. We have gone into oblivion. We have gone into this dullness. Slowly we have to be shaken out of it, grow into it. That is the long preparation we have to go through. And ultimately, the end of the journey, we break into the infinity of God. We break into a new plain, new world, new experience. It is as if the universe has many layers, many planes, and you have to break into the topmost layer, like a mountain peak that breaks, cuts through the sky and enters into a world that is unseen to men who live down below. It's above the clouds, above the sky, it's above everything. Across our nature's borderline, we escape. So our nature is a borderline, it's an outline. And constantly we have to change, like a sketch that is incomplete. You say, no, you have to correct this, you have to repair this, you have to improve here. Like a preliminary sketch, we keep on changing the line in order to create a very beautiful expression. Again and again he draws the image of the artist or the sculptor who shapes perfection. But it's very slow, it's long, it has to pass through many stages of change, of difficulty. In the end we escape into supernature's arc of living light not light that is perceived in the distance, we live that light, we become that, we are that. So this is the whole journey of consciousness, which is evolution. Now he comes back to the protagonist, the main character, because this is what Sri does all along in the poem. He talks, it's a narrative, it's a description of experience, whether it is of Ashwapati or of Savitri, the, that is the main character, the protagonist. And then he generalizes, universalizes, it's true for all. But not immediately, we are also part of the same journey, same process. But 
unlike Ashwapati, who was single-mindedly asking for this, who that's why he was in the front of the memorial quest, the average human being does not ask constantly to break into that new world and new consciousness. That's why he is unlike us. He's a leader and a guide. And this now, he says, was witnessed in that son of force. Son of force, Tapasvi, all his energies were turned only upwards in one direction. <coughs> there was no, uh, you might say, wastage. He did not, so much of our energy is, you know, lost in all kinds of other movements. To be able to move in one direction for the, move only towards the goal, that is what is really tapasya. And that is why his name is Ashwapati. Ashwa is force, is energy. He is the master of his energies. Pati is Lord. If we can master all our energies and direct them in only the direction we have put before us, we can arrive much faster at the goal. Even Titans do that. And they have also been the... But they are not being able to, or they don't want to conquer the ego. But they also bring all their vital energies towards the realization of their goal. And so they do it. But they become huge egos in the process. So they have to be destroyed in the long run. So even the Supreme has to come down to destroy these great Asuras. Because they are enormous powers. This now was witnessed in that son of force. In him, that high transition laid its base. That foundation of the future humanity, which is superhumanity. He becomes the first embodiment of that future humanity. Original and supernal em immanence of which all nature's process is the art, the cosmic worker set his secret hand to turn this frail mud engine to heaven use. This frail mud engine is the outer embodied being which is really made of clay or mud. To make the, just like the sculptor, can manifest the divine in you might say, a figure of clay or stone. This is when the worker, the sculptor, the divine shaper sets his hand. But what is the difference? The clay allows itself to be shaped. We often don't allow ourselves to be shaped. So this is why he has to work much more slowly, carefully, we are often under the notion that I can do it myself, I can do it on my own, I don't need anyone to tell me what to do. There is an ego, there is a possibility of the development of different faculties, which are also, eventually they will help. But at that given moment they come in the way. Slowly we become more complete and much richer than a, a mere figure made out of stone. But just as stone can manifest the spirit, so can man, so can we. So, but he has, to, we have to allow that cosmic worker. Why is it possible for man to do it? Because the divine is immanent in man. Immanent is that which is indwelling. Because he is within us, he dwells inside us. It is this, the consciousness which is he and the worker which is she. She can bring out 
that which is within us, the divine consciousness which is within us, to bring it out into the open, so that we can become outwardly an expression of what we are within. And that is the whole purpose and method. Art here is not art in the ordinary sense of painting and sculpture only, but it is method, it is the how something is done. And that is the method of nature, that is the purpose of nature. She works on the outer being, she is the force, she is the creative mother power who shapes, who gives birth to slowly a being that is waiting to be born. That being is already there within, it has to come out into the open. A presence wrought behind the ambiguous screen. Ambiguous, you know, that which is hard to describe, which be, it can be something that harms or hurts or disturbs, and at the same time is helpful. It has two meanings. It is, so the outer being is helpful for a long time. We need this outer nature. We have to grow. We can't only be just spirit and we have to live in the world of matter. Matter is unconscious, we are unconscious, but that is the starting point of our journey towards consciousness. But a presence works. Rot is past tense of work, old. But it is used today, especially in the case of resistant metal, like wrought iron. You hit and our resistance is hard as iron. So it has to keep on working on us, shaping, making us pass through fire or hammering. It beat its soil, that is the power of that creative energy, the soil matter to bear a titan's weight, like you have to keep on heating and beating the steel to make it hard and strong. So also the pressure of an enormous energy, hmm, refining half-hewn blocks of natural strength, this is our inert material being, it built his soul into a statue to God. Statue is an outer expression in the in material substance, wood or stone or metal, but to be able to manifest the spirit in matter again. That is the artist who can manifest the spirit in matter. So we stop at that. Too.